Hello, this is Dr. Jenkins, and here we are for part two of this week's material. In the first part, we talked about water and electrolytes, and in the second time, second part, we're talking about minerals. You're going to see that this chapter will be similar in many ways to our chapter that we did previously on vitamins. So you won't have to know all of them. That would be ridiculous, I think. But we are gonna, I am going to ask you to know some of the major vitamins, excuse me, minerals, and then also some of the characteristics of minerals. So here we go. So here's our similar structure. We'll talk about some structure and characteristics, and then we're going to go over some of the specific minerals. Okay, now this is different from vitamins. You may recall that vitamins were considered organic, and that meant that vitamins were a little more fragile. If we leave fruit out, the vitamin C can oxidize and start to turn the, the fruit, for example, brown. But minerals are inorganic, and for our purposes, that just means that they're less fragile. We are going to talk about two categories of minerals, our major minerals, which those are the minerals that we need higher amounts of, and our minor, excuse me, trace minerals that we need less of. Okay, some other characteristics. So in addition to minerals being inorganic and therefore less fragile, we can also talk about minerals. They do not get broken down. Think back to our GI chapter. Carbs, fats, proteins, even some mineral, uh, some vitamins. I keep confusing vitamins and minerals, I'm sorry. Let me say that again. Carbs, fats, and proteins, and some vitamins, they have to be broken down. They have to be digested mechanically and or chemically. Well, minerals do not. They do not need to be broken down, which means that minerals have their function inside the body without being digested. They have their function inside the body in the same form as what they were ingested as. Cool. There are some interactions. I didn't discuss this with the vitamins. That's true of some vitamins, but it actually becomes more of an issue for some of the minerals. You don't have to know any of the specifics. Just the general idea that there are some interactions with mineral intake, which means that um, different minerals can actually compete with each other. And this is a good example. Too much of one mineral can actually decrease absorption of another mineral. So even though we don't need minerals in very high amounts because they're a micronutrient, remember? There is some interplay between them, and that's called an interaction, where one mineral may compete with another and cause another mineral to be absorbed more or less. And then I do want to introduce the term bioavailability. Bioavailability means the rate at which they can get into the body for use. So it's all about rate. A higher bioavailability means that things can get into the body for use quicker. A lower or longer bioavailability means that it takes longer for something to get through the body, into the body where it needs to be used. So I just want to be, introduce this concept. So be able to define it. Bioavailability simply refers to the rate at which minerals are absorbed. And as it is with many things, um, the bioavailability of minerals varies. So I'm not going to ask you specific questions, uh, but be able to define it. Okay, just like vitamins, sometimes we can have a toxicity. Just like vitamins, if we don't get enough of a certain mineral, it can cause a, defici a deficiency that shows as, um, that gives us symptoms or has health problems associated with it. I'm not going to give you any specifics here, but the same thing applies for minerals. Too much can be a bad thing sometimes, and too little can also have negative consequences. Okay, so 
When we introduced the nutrients, let's just do a review. I think the more we can review, the better, right? So we had our macronutrients. And remember, these are not bigger in size necessarily. Our macronutrients just identifies them by the fact that we need more of them. We need these in greater amounts. And these are the big boys, well, big girls too, I suppose. We had carbohydrates, fats, protein. And our last one from the last chapter we talked about is water. So these are all considered macronutrients, all four of them, because we need them in larger amounts in our diet versus the micronutrients. And our micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. So here we are in the chapter on minerals. It's not that micronutrients are less important. It's just that in order for them to do their function, we don't need them in as great of amounts. So they're just as important, but we don't need them in as great of amounts. When I introduced the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, I refer to them as the supporting cast. They don't usually get a lot of the credit. Um, you know, they're not directly used for energy. It's not kind of sexy like carbohydrates and fat. It doesn't directly build muscle like protein. However, um, they're absolutely needed. So when we talk about minerals, I'm going to begin by talking about two major functions that minerals have in the body. And as a matter of fact, most, almost all of the minerals that we talk about will fit into one of these. Minerals tend to either help with structure and body processes like muscle contraction so minerals tend to help with structure or certain body processes, or we haven't really talked about this yet. Minerals play a role in fluid balance. Sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium. We don't need very many of them in our diet, but they're also important. So start with these two major functions. Okay. We already introduced this, that of the minerals, there are some that we need more of, the major or macro minerals, and there are some minerals that we don't need as many of, the trace or micro minerals. Here are the dosage. You don't need to know them, though. I do want to point out that funny U thing is a microgram. That is a smaller unit. For example, in the vitamins chapter, sometimes we talked about grams. So with, for example, vitamin C, we talked about the daily need being 75 to 90 grams per day. Well, micrograms is a much smaller quantity. So this is just more evidence that in a lot of cases, we don't need as many minerals. They're still really important. But we don't need as many of them. Okay, here they are, folks, the macro minerals and the trace or micro minerals. You need to know the ones that have a star beside them. You can imagine on our upcoming quiz and in the future final exam, a lot of matching question, the function of sodium is. Okay, so I'm going to try and make it as simple as I can. But a lot of this is just memorization. All right, I know you're bored, <laughs> perhaps, at this point in the semester. Stick with me. The good thing is that you're listening to this video that absolutely helps. It helps you to know what to focus on. So hopefully it saves your study time down the road. So you're not wasting time on things that um, you don't need to know. There's my dog, Allie. She has since passed away, but there, there was my pretty girl. Okay, you only have to know what is starred. There is, just like I had for the vitamins, there's a minerals overview document that you might find helpful to study from. We're gonna start with the macronutrients. And of course, we're gonna start with sodium. You might see it spelled out like that, or you might see it in its scientific formula form as an ion, Na+. Sodium is an electrolyte. We talked about this in the water chapter. 
electrolyte is a charged particle that carries a current. So it's an electrolyte. Most of our sodium we get from table salt. So you should know that. I'm not going to ask you 90%, but most of our salt we get from table salt that's added to food while we're eating it or cooking it, or sometimes it's added for um, preservation, right? <clears throat> there is some naturally occurring sodium in some fruits and vegetables and some dairy, um, but most of it is in processed foods. Now, this shouldn't be surprising. We know that we get most of our salt, sodium, from table salt, but of that table salt, three-quarters of it is from processed food, Actually, a relatively smaller amount is what we add during cooking. Just saying. Okay. Um, the function of sodium. Number one function, fluid balance. And also, it is a preservative when added to food. It can kind of bring out flavor because water follows salt. So it tends to bring out some water and flavor in the foods. But a lot of times it's used as an additive and a preservative. Inside our body, sodium fluid balance all the way. So we're talking about maintaining the right amount of fluid in our cells and in our blood. This, the goal is to prevent dehydration, but also to prevent hyperhydration. So salt plays a really important role. And one thing that, you don't have to know this, but... A really important principle in physiology of the body is that water, whoops, I don't need to write it if you know what it is. Water follows salt. So it's this connection that allows sodium to be such a good helper in terms of um, maintaining fluid balance. If we need to move water one place or another to make sure that there's the appropriate amount of water, not too much, too little, if we send salt in that direction, water's gonna follow. So our two functions of sodium, fluid balance and as a, as a preservative. How does it help with fluid balance? Mostly because water follows salt. So actually I would like you to know that. Change my mind. <laughs> so that's, that's in simplistic terms, that's how sodium is able to help with fluid balance because water follows it. So we can send sodium in one direction where we want to send water and then we can get that done. You can read about the daily needs. Um, I'm not going to ask you that number, but this is a number that is higher. So if we talk about some of the other minerals, the units were in micrograms, that funny U-shaped thingy. And that just means less. Well, here we're in milligrams. So we do need a reasonable amount of salt a day, but it is not hard in this country, ladies and gentlemen. In the United States, because we have so much processed food with salt added to it for taste to lengthen shelf life and as a preservative, we usually have no trouble getting enough of that in from the processed foods. Is As a matter of fact, most Americans bring in over double. Easy. Okay, one of my favorite examples of this is the Lunchables. This is a great example of a processed food. You think, oh, how bad can crackers and ham and cheese be? Sounds pretty wholesome and delicious. Well, look at the sodium. 1,100 milligrams just from this one package. So you're almost getting your full 1,500 just from one small pack, 4.5 ounces. Mm, all that salt. I mean, ham is pretty salty to begin with. The crackers are pretty salty to begin with, but also for the preservative fact. Even if we look at um, deli meat, particularly deli meat that is packaged, so one serving of this ham contains 740 milligrams of sodium. I'm not going to ask you these numbers, folks, but I'm just giving you some examples in real life. You know, one serving size is pretty small, so I bet a lot of us probably have more than one serving size of this meat. So that means that you're actually bringing in more than 740 milligrams, so you're probably getting close to 1,000, which again, you're two-thirds of the way to your daily needs already. 
Okay, because this is a biology class, we have to get a little bit deeper. So it's really important that we have the appropriate amounts of sodium because sodium is needed to help with that fluid balance. So if you work that the other way, if we have a sodium imbalance, if for some reason we have too much or too little sodium, couldn't that also influence our water balance? Yeah, because they go hand in hand. So everyone knows it's important to drink enough water, but do we know how important it is to make sure we have the right amount of sodium? Probably not, even though they're very much related. So I'm gonna try and keep this as simple as I can. When it comes to fluid balance, when it comes to fluid balance, and that refers to water, but also salt, because these two go hand in hand. So when it comes to maintaining fluid balance, which includes salt, it's all about the kidneys. The kidneys, not only do they filter the blood so we can filter out things that we don't want and then we can urinate them out as waste. Well, the kidneys, in addition to filtering the blood, the kidneys also play a role in fluid balance. And it doesn't happen as quickly as like sweating does, you know, if you're Core temperature gets dangerously high. Even if it just gets high, we can utilize sweating. We can send blood flow to the surface of the skin. And then that fluid from the blood, the water, will evaporate off the skin to cool the body. Well, that example can happen pretty quickly in body terms, but the kidneys work slowly. They're always little, the kidneys are always churning, doing their job. And over the course of hours, we can see real shifts in fluid balance. So make sure you know these two examples. If sodium levels are too low, and I'm going to add that, so we're not talking about a minor shift. You know, we expect throughout the course of a day, there's going to be some minor fluctuations. I'm talking about if sodium becomes too low. If the sodium becomes too low, the kidneys will excrete less urine and retain more water. It makes sense. My body doesn't have enough sodium. So the kidneys will actually slow down. And by slowing down, your body will release less urine. And if I release less urine, I'm actually retaining more water. If I retain more water, I'm also retaining more salt, which will help to bring my sodium levels back up to normal. And then the opposite is true. If sodium levels are too high, maybe you had for lunch some Lunchables, some French fries, some extra crackers. I'm talking about salt on top of salt on top of salt, right? <laughs> well, you're probably going to have too much salt in your blood, right? So for a period of time, if I have too much salt, my kidneys will work harder and I will pee out more. And that's a way of getting rid of more water. And when I get a bit of more water, I get rid of more sodium. So if my initial problem was having too much sodium, well, I can pee out more. And that, that way I'm losing water and losing sodium to bring sodium levels back down to normal. A little bit tougher there. So maybe go through it a couple times, but those are the two basic examples. If you do have too much salt, it could lead to heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, dehydration. You should know that these are all potential effects of too much salt. You can see the upper limit. Remember we talked about the tolerable upper limit? Well, for sodium, it's 2,300. And that's pretty easy to get, actually, in the U.S., Okay, now this is pretty much the best time to talk about blood pressure because one thing that happens, particularly as a result of a high sodium diet, is someone has increased blood pressure above normal. And that's otherwise known as hypertension. Hyper is like too much of, more. So we have too much blood pressure, especially when we're talking about at rest. You know, if you're just sitting there, your blood pressure should be relatively low. Now, of course, when we exercise, blood pressure is gonna go up, but hypertension is a, a problem of blood pressure even at rest. 
but it's elevated even at rest. So make sure you know what blood pressure is. It's the, the force that blood exerts against the arterial walls. It's normally about 120 over 80. You, know, you might see it now at 110 over 80 or something, but we'll just go with the good old fashioned 120 millimeters of mercury over 80 millimeters of mercury. The top number is called systolic when the heart contracts. Bottom number is called diastolic when the heart relaxes. You don't need to know those. Just know the, the ideal resting blood pressure. So someone is hypertensive if it gets to be over 140 on the top. You can be pre-hypertensive. The good thing about this is with diet and exercise, with lifestyle changes, we can reverse this. When, now you might see this um, slide and get freaked out, please don't. All we're saying is the body likes to be efficient. So we see a picture of the heart here. We like, we like when we don't need as much pressure to pump a lot of blood. So under normal conditions, these arrows are kind of narrow. They're not very thick which means that we need some pressure, of course, and it's actually a pretty good amount, but this is what the body is, this is what these organs are made to handle. We need a certain amount of pressure. That didn't show up very well, did it? Let me switch to white. Sometimes even the best laid plans. <laughs> Let's go with the white. You need a certain amount of pressure to pump the blood out of the heart to the body. You need a certain amount of pressure to pump the blood from the left side of the heart, excuse me, the right side of the heart to the lungs. Well, notice how that arrow is pretty thin. We like that it's efficient. We don't need to make the heart have to work any harder. It can just work eh, moderately, pump out plenty of blood. Well, when there's chronic high blood pressure, look at the arrows in this picture. The arrows are thicker, indicating that it takes more pressure. Even at rest, you've got to pump out so hard just to get the same amount of blood out. You've got to pump out so hard just to get the same amount of blood out. And what that does is, is it overworks our heart muscle. You're just asking it to work harder and harder every beat of every day. It has to work harder just to pump out the same amount of blood. So the heart muscle can actually break down. Okay. Um, hypertension or high blood pressure can also lead to, let me say this, it is also associated with a host of other things. Um, hypertension is largely genetic. So even if you have a great lifestyle, good diet, you're active, you still may be predisposed for hypertension if your uh, biological mother and or father had it, have it. Um, this disease though, hypertension, high blood pressure is associated with all these. So they kind of go hand in hand. Here are some examples of how to lower sodium in your diet. In addition to Cutting back on processed foods, reducing the salt that you add to the foods. You can also help lower blood pressure by losing excess weight, being active. The actual low sodium diet, maybe you've heard of this, is called the DASH diet. This has been around for decades, geez. And it's pretty easy to laugh at it. Like, oh yes, it's a nutritional chart, DASH diet to lower sodium to prevent high blood pressure. But in all seriousness, it is a good roadmap. Everyone needs a roadmap. You know what, if I sit here and just list off things, it probably goes in one ear, not the other. But everyone can benefit from a nice roadmap. So here are some things, and it's not surprising folks, more vegetables and fruit, more grains that are whole grains, less, process, oh, there's no processed food on this one, except for the cookie at the top. So just know that the DASH diet is associated with trying to reduce high blood pressure. You don't have to know the specifics of it, but just know that DASH diet is a, spe a special diet meant to lower blood pressure.
Okay. Now we just finished talking about sodium. And what we find is sodium and potassium, you might see it spelled out like that, but the chemical form is K plus, it's a positively charged ion. Sodium and potassium work together. So guess what? They're both electrolytes. They both function in fluid balance. Make sure you look over some of the sources of potassium. I think everyone knows that bananas are high in potassium, but wait, leafy greens. Ah, these leafy greens are everywhere, I'm telling you. So make sure you know both of those sources. Fluid balance. This is the same function as sodium. They work together. They do tend to be on opposite sides of the cell. So you don't have to know this necessarily, but if you're wondering, potassium tends to live more inside of the cells and sodium tends to live more outside of the cells. So they actually tend to move in different directions. Sodium tends to diffuse in, whereas potassium diffuses out. So they're kind of on opposite sides, but we need both of them working together for fluid balance. And there are some additional functions of potassium. You know, I think everyone throws in potassium with um, fluid balance, but we forget, or maybe we don't even know, that there's other functions. Every muscle contraction needs potassium. A lot of times we think about the cardiac muscle, the heart muscle, um, having an imbalance of potassium can lead to an arrhythmia of the heart. So if we disrupt the normal amount of potassium that we should have at the muscle, uh, it can lead to the muscle not being able to fire. And we also need potassium for every nerve impulse when we send an electrical current. Pretty crazy, isn't it? So potassium is really important. You don't need to know the daily needs. Um, what I do have, though, in red, is that most Americans don't get enough. This is the opposite of sodium, right? We said sodium, most Americans get plenty. But most Americans don't get enough potassium. Those leafy greens, some of the fruits. Okay. Here are some things that could happen if you have too much or too little. So if we have too much, that is called hyperkalemia. Um, I'm not going to ask you the hyperkalemia. I'm just going to break the word down in case you're interested. Hyper means too much. I think about the K symbol right in the middle, hyperkalemia, too much potassium. This is what I was saying can cause irregular heartbeats, arrhythmias. So you don't need to know the word hyperkalemia. Just need to know that if we have too much potassium, it can affect the heart muscle. That, that would be very, very serious. Here's what could happen if we have too little potassium or hypokalemia. Um, oh, I got a misspelling here. This should be compensate. So even though the body doesn't usually get, even though we don't get enough through diet, the body has some compensatory mechanisms and usually we're okay. The, the time that you would consider, but you would worry about being low in potassium would be whenever you're significantly lower in fluid volume, diarrhea, vomiting. I'm not going to ask you that, but <clears throat> there they are nonetheless. Okay, moving on. See, these, these minerals are important, folks. What about calcium? You might see it spelled out. You might see it technically. If we saw it, it should be with two pluses, but you might, just might see it with one. Calcium is abundant, pretty easy to get enough calcium, usually if you're eating a well-balanced diet. What I want to point out in terms of the function of calcium, everyone knows that calcium, I think, plays a role in bone, gives structure to bone. Drinking a glass of milk full of calcium and vitamin D is good for your bones. So of course, calcium. We store calcium in the bones. That's our calcium storage site. We store calcium in the bones. 
And while the calcium is there, it gives a lot of strength to the bones. It's great. But what I want to point out is a lot of that calcium leaves the bones. So it's, it's, not, stat, it's not static. We're not saying that the bones just store calcium and that's it. It's just a big storage tank. Nothing happens. Well, that's not the case at all. While the calcium is being stored there, it gives bone structure. But there's constantly going to be a little bit of calcium always going out to the bloodstream because we need calcium in the bloodstream because calcium is needed for so many things outside of the bone. I apologize for yawning. So while calcium is in the bone, it gives structure to bone. But always, 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 there's going to be some calcium leaving the bone. And that helps, helps to have calcium function all over the body. You can read about some of the sources. I think we're pretty aware. A lot of the sources are dairy. But also fortified juices and cereals. I'm going to add that in there. Because I, I, I always like to give an example of maybe things that you might not expect. So I think everyone has an idea that a lot of dairy foods have calcium in it. What you may not know, though, is that a lot of cereals and juices are fortified with calcium. So here we go, what are the functions? Well, we already said that calcium gives structure to bones. It does to teeth also. And then the calcium that leaves the bone travels throughout the bloodstream. Calcium is needed for every muscle contraction. Calcium is needed for every nerve impulse conduction. That's the same as potassium, didn't we say that? Yes, so a lot of these minerals play a role in those body processes that I talked about. Things like muscle contractions and making a nerve impulse. So I don't wanna to get too in the weeds here, but I always jump at the chance to use a little bit of physiology. So just check it out. Here's a picture of a, the inside of a muscle, your skeletal muscle. And all I'm pointing out is, among all this physiology, what do you see? Calcium. So way down, microscopically, into the muscle, we need calcium. This is more information if you're interested, but you don't need to know those steps. I just got a little carried away. All we need to know is, look, calcium's in there. It's important. You can read about the daily needs. I'd like you to have an idea of these. That's why it's star. Just have an idea. And what are the food sources? I already talked about. The things that I would like you to know for the food sources would be dairy and fortified cereals. You know, cereals get a bad rap because indeed, if we talk about Lucky Charms, <laughs> there's a lot of sugar and of course, much less nutritional value. But think about Cheerios, think about Wheaties, Raisin Bran, even though these all have a lot of added sugar, some of these are quite nutritious. Too little, if we don't have enough, too little, it could affect our bone health, right? So not having enough calcium can cause osteoporosis, which is a lower density bone. More common in women, older women in particular. So look at the top. This is the spongy bone of normal healthy bone. And look at the bottom. This is spongy bone of an osteoporotic bone. Instead of being dense, it is much looser. It's lower in bone density. Um, I don't know that I'm going to ask. Yeah, I'm not going to ask you about this. If you're interested in how we regulate blood calcium, you can dive into this head first. But I'm not going to ask you this on a quiz. Okay. Uh, the next few slides are for information only. Um, if you're interested, our peak bone mass, our peak bone density occurs pretty early in our adulthood. Um, there is a bone mineral density test that we can actually get a measure of our bone density. 
Of course, females are much higher risk, especially females of a greater age. Certain ethnicities are at a higher risk. A smaller boned person, more petite, is at a greater risk. And you can read all about that. But again, won't be on the test. Just got a little carried away. Phosphorus. This is actually the second most abundant mineral in the body. Holy cow. We don't think of phosphorus that much. All I want you to do is somehow pair it together, phosphorus and bones and teeth. So in this way, it's very similar to calcium in its bone function. Not everything else, but just the bone. Didn't calcium give structure to bones and teeth? Well, so does phosphorus. It's a lot of that structural material in bone. You can read about this. This is all extra. All you need to know is the main function. Magnesium. We have a good deal of magnesium. What I want you to know is that one unique function of magnesium is it is needed in order to do protein synthesis. Remember, protein synthesis is when our bodies make protein. All of our cells are little protein producing factories. We need magnesium for that process. Here are daily needs, here's some extra. You don't need to know all the rest of this. This is just meant to be a resource. Chloride, you might see chloride like that because it's a negatively charged ion. This is gonna work with potassium and sodium. So sodium and potassium are our positively charged ions. Chloride is our negatively charged ions. Ion, but all together, they play a role in fluid balance. Sulfur can play a role in helping proteins with their shape. So if you can just pair these together. Don't need to know the rest here. Okay. Um, you know, let me go back to the beginning. What, what was that was um, sulfur, right? Yeah, I have it starred, and if I'm giving you a little bit of um, whiplash, I'm sorry. I don't know of another way to do it on this app. Okay, sulfur. Was that on your list here? Let's go back. I want to be sure. Look at how much we've covered so far. Yeah, okay, so sulfur had a star beside it. Okay, so so far, um, everything that I've mentioned you need to know about. And we're pretty soon going to move into the micronutrients. Yes. Okay. Iron, copper, zinc, fluoride, iodine. Okay. I was just making sure. Close your eyes so you don't get motion sickness. It's like the, it's like the tilter world, isn't it? <laughs> At the fair, the carnival. God, that would make me so sick. All right. Got to get through that. Calcium, magnesium, chloride. So, okay, here we go. Whoo, sorry about that. So now we're getting to the micro minerals or trace minerals. We need even less of these than the major minerals, but they're still important. Case and point is iron. Iron is a symbol F-E, just F-Y-I, ha ha. Iron comes in two forms. Heme is the form of iron that we get from animal sources, and it's actually more easily absorbed. Non-heme is the iron we get from plant sources. So indeed, vegetarians and vegans, they can get, they can get non-heme iron. But the problem is it's not as easily absorbed. Not to say it's not absorbed at all because it is, just not as easy, easily as the animal form. Now, this being said, we don't need to go running crazy with this. Especially in this country, our, our meat intake is usually far exceeding what we actually need. So... Very few people who are meat eaters are at a risk for iron deficiency. Um, there's some populations that are more prone, particularly women who are menstruating. So if a woman is menstruating, she's losing blood for a period of that month. And when you lose blood, you're losing iron. Because as we're going to find out, iron is part of hemoglobin, which sits on the red blood cell surface to carry oxygen. Okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Just to start... 
We just identified that iron is found in two forms, the heme from animal sources and the non-heme from plant sources. The heme is much more easily absorbed. What is the function? It is on red blood cells to help transport oxygen. So if we have a red blood cell, unfortunately, oxygen is not able to directly attach to it. So instead, we have to have this big protein called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is partially made up of iron. And oxygen is able to bind to the hemoglobin. So we need iron in order to form hemoglobin at all. So we don't need a whole lot of it, but, oh, it's also important. You can read about the daily needs. You don't need to know those. The sources would, of course, be meats, the heme, but there's also some, some uh, vegetarian ones. I don't have those starred, so you don't need to know them. Too much or too little? Well, not having enough could cause anemia. Anemia is not enough red blood cells, which means not enough ability to care, carry oxygen. So too little iron would absolutely affect our red blood cell health. And as I said, iron, um, even though most people in the United States have no trouble getting enough iron, um, menstruating females need to really consider it because they're losing blood each day of that, that portion of the menses, so they need even more iron to form more hemoglobin to make new red blood cells that can carry oxygen. Copper. Copper plays a role with cells helping to generate energy in the cells. Uh, it's definitely indirect. So as was the case with our B vitamins, um, which, with, which help with carbohydrate and fat metabolism, this is even more indirect, but the fact remains, copper can help indirectly, can help cells to generate energy. All the rest here is extra. Zinc. Zinc plays a role with growth and the immune system. So again, just pair them together. Isn't it crazy that we have all these vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates, fats and proteins and cholesterol. We have so many things. And even if we don't eat that well, um, we're still able largely to have the body work. So the body's just incredible in its ability to take whatever we get it to usually function really well. Um, zinc is something else that can be found in meat, particularly red meat. So I know some people will say, oh, I need to get my meat today, my red meat for iron. That's, that's true. But we forget zinc is also found in red meat. So this would be a consideration for a vegetarian or a vegan athlete. This doesn't mean that they can only get it through red meat, but whereas other individuals would more easily get it through red meat, a vegetarian or vegan just needs to be a little bit more careful and thoughtful to make sure they get enough foods that contain zinc. Selenium helps to regulate thyroid hormones. These are the hormones that oversee our metabolic rate. That's really important. The rest here is all extra. You can read about too much or too little, but you don't need to know it. Fluoride. I think everyone has heard probably about fluoride and our teeth. So fluoride is very much associated with the health of our teeth. And in a different way than we talked about with calcium, for example. So calcium we need for our bone and our teeth health, but more for structure. The function of fluoride is more about maintaining the enamel. And if that enamel breaks down, we're more likely to have what can become cavities. All this other information is extra. We're just going to pair together fluoride and uh, the health of our teeth. Um, oftentimes in the U.S. here, we get fluoride from our public drinking water. There is some controversy about, oh, don't put fluoride in my water. Um, but the science is out there, folks. Um, the proper amount of fluoride is very helpful to our bone, to our teeth health. 
All right, you don't need to know chromium. We're getting kind of in the weeds here. So this is just extra. You don't need to know the effect of chromium. I would like to make you, I would like to ask, I'm not gonna make you do anything, although I would like you to study to do well. I would ask that you know the function of iodine. This helps the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a gland right over your, right near your Adam's apple on your throat. And as I mentioned before, the thyroid gland is what makes our hormones for our metabolic rate. So it's really important. Um, we actually need, the gland needs iodine in order to do the, the job of the gl gland. Where do we get most of our um, sources of iodine? Iodized salt. If you look on the little canister of salt, Morton salt, it will say iodized. Some of the fancier salts don't have that. Uh, I thought I had a picture of the iodine, um, the Morton salt. I don't. Some of the fancier salts don't have um, iodine, but probably some of the salt that was used somewhere along the way did. We can get some iodine through um, saltwater fish, for example but most of us probably get it through the iodized salt. Not having enough iodine can lead to a goiter, and I would like you to know that. Maybe you've seen pictures of these before. Um, not common in this particular country, but it's when the thyroid gland becomes huge. So that big mass in their throat is the actual thyroid gland, being overly active. So if the thyroid gland isn't getting enough iodine, it's going to become overactive to try and make up the difference. And it will actually enlarge in size. You don't need to know about manganese. Getting too far in the weeds here, don't worry about that. You don't need to know about molybdenum. It's a funny word to say, don't worry about that. And then we see some examples of other minerals. You don't need to know these either. So in putting it all together with vitamins and minerals, we can see the ones that we usually get enough of. And then by process of elimination, ones that we don't get enough of. I'm not going to ask you this table, but here it is. This is an idea of the scale, right, of how many grams or micrograms we need of the, mac the major or macro versus the trace or micro. I'm not going to ask you these numbers, but as we said, we need the most calcium. And then phosphorus was kind of a surprise, maybe for the second most. I'm not saying that these on the right are any less important. We just don't need as many of them. All right, folks, good job. I will see you next time.